Hi, welcome back. Back to Lagrange equations. We have introduced this method to describe the motion of particles that is equivalent to Newton's second law. We can describe interactions of objects as forces acting on acting that induce accelerations or as nature only allowing those actions that are stationary. The first one might be more intuitive with our daily experience. The second one is a fundamental principle with deep implications that extend to quantum mechanics or relativity. In quantum mechanics, for example, Richard Feynman described the motion of particle, let's say an electron that goes from point A to point B, as the electron exploring all the possible trajectories all at once and superposed. Because each trajectory has an associated phase, phases from nearby trajectories would cancel out each other, and only the one trajectory that makes action an extreme would survive. That is the one that we observe. This is not the place to deepen into quantum descriptions, but just wanted to stress how fundamental Hamilton's principle of stationary action is. Now, it's time to talk about forces of constraint in this Lagrangian approach. The Grandjean approach is built up on energy. No forces are involved. But we know that each constraint limits the motion of a particle. As a matter of fact, it reduces the degrees of freedom of the system. This simplifies the problem as there are less independent variables. But we might be interested at some point in knowing what those forces of constraints are. Let me solve an example where we have an object sliding off on a surface of a hemisphere, the object is constrained to move on the surface because of the normal force from the hemisphere on the object. This normal force is a constraint, and we might be interested in writing it explicitly. Let me write the Lagrangian. Because of the symmetry of the system, I will use polar coordinates. So, for the kinetic energy of the object, I have one half of mr squared theta dot squared. For the potential energy, I will consider zero at the bottom of the hemisphere, so it will be mgr cosine of theta. So the Lagrangian writes as... I apply now Lagrange equations and get the equation of motion as theta two dots equals to g over r sine of theta. This basically is f equal ma for the tangential coordinate. So this is how we solve for the equation of motion. But what about the force of constraint that I was worried about? Well, if you look at how I solved this problem, I already assumed that constraint by going from two coordinates, r and theta, to only one, theta. This implicitly was by imposing the constraint. What I'm going to do now is solve the same problem but assuming I have two degrees of freedom, r and theta. It is at the end when I will impose the constraint. This can be justified by going to the microscopic level and see that the object compresses a tiny bit the hemisphere, so there is some change in the radius r there. Then the surface pushes back, but the radial position below the object is a tiny little bit smaller than the actual radius of the hemisphere. There is a constrained potential that avoids the object from sinking deep into this hemisphere. Because of this, I now write the full Lagrangian as One half of m times r dot square plus r square theta dot square minus m g r cosine of theta minus v of r. Now I apply Lagrange's equations to both coordinates r and theta. These two are the equations of motion for the block on the hemisphere, assuming it can sink, but it actually is not going to sink. 
It is there where I am going to apply the constraint. It is here where I am assuming that there is no deformation of the surface. With this in mind, I impose that R dot and R2 dots are zero and lowercase r is equal to capital R. So I get the following simplifications. With this, the first equation is the tangential equation of motion I found before, the equation of motion for theta. And the second equation tells that the negative derivative of the potential with respect to r evaluated at the radius capital R is mg cosine of theta minus mr theta dot squared. Well, the derivative of a potential is a force, so the derivative of this potential is the constraint force I was looking for. Because the potential is derived with respect to the radial direction, it is the constraint force applied in the radial direction. So this has to be the normal force. And it happens to coincide with m equal ma in the radial direction. Of course, this result is only valid if the normal force, that here depends on theta and theta dot, is positive. When it is zero, then the object is not in contact with the hemisphere anymore, and it can actually move in the radial direction lowercase r is no longer equal to capital R. So the trick is to not consider the constraint when you write the Lagrangian, then apply Lagrange equations and finally impose the constraint on the results. We'll do some more practice on this and we'll talk about what happens if you want to start the problem choosing Cartesian coordinates instead of polar coordinates. May the Lagrange equations be with you.